All right, in this chapter, chapter five, we're going to be going over how to form a business and all of the things that go into how you actually start setting them up. You see the learning objectives that we have. Uh, we're looking at sole proprietorships, uh, partnerships, corporations, mergers and acquisitions, uh, franchising, in case you want to get into that, and then also the idea of cooperatives or co-ops. Now there's basically three ways of setting up a business. You have sole proprietorships, you have partnerships, and you have corporations. Sole proprietorship, basically it's just you, maybe you and your family. Partnership is almost like a marriage. In other words, you and several others are getting together to form that business. And then a corporation is where people buy stock, they become owners in that organization. And when you start thinking about the number of businesses that are out there, a large majority of businesses are sole proprietorships. However, a majority of the income and the sales go to the large corporations. Most of the sole proprietorships that you might see out there are small businesses. There are various advantages of being a sole proprietor. Okay, it's easy to set it up. All you have to do is just put together some uh, business cards, uh, hang your shingle out, and you're ready to go. Now it says being your own, own boss. I disagree with that. You have a lot of freedom as far as the things that you do and how you do with them. The thing is, when you are working with some of your customers, some of your clients, they are the boss as far as I'm concerned. And it says no special taxes. Well, there are no special taxes. The thing is, when you're working for a company, you're going to pay 7.6% of your salary into Medicare and Social Security. The company also puts in 7.6% in Medicare and Social Security for you. When you're a sole proprietorship, you pay the entire 15%. There's no special taxes, but there are more taxes. Now the downside, unlimited liability. You screw up, you are on the hook for all of the damages that you may have done. You have limited financial resources. In other words, the only finances or the only money that you can get are what's in your savings and whatever loans you can pick up. Don't even think about paid vacations. You're going to have to buy your own medical insurance. You will not be paid for any kind of vacations. You have to do your own computer support. You're on your own. You have more freedom. The thing is, there's a lot more responsibility that goes along with it. When you think about work-life balance as a small business owner, as a sole proprietor, be willing to work a lot of hours. I know that with my business, and I set it up as a sole proprietorship, I was working 70, 80 hours a week sometimes. When you start thinking about partnerships, there's basically two types, general partnership and limited partnership. General partnership is where all of the partners are actually involved in the business, in managing the business, and also share in all of the profits. With a limited partnership, a limited partner is not involved with the day-to-day -day business. And they do participate in some of the profits. The thing is, if it goes under, if there's a problem, they are limited to the amount of, to the amount of liability that they have to put in to only the money that they paid into the partnership. So a general partner is somebody who has unlimited liability and they're active in the firm. Limited partner invests money in it and they're only on the hook for the amount of money that they put into it. Now you could also have a couple of other forms of partnerships. You have your master limited partnership, it looks kind of like a corporation, and you have your limited liability partnership. All right, so where you're limiting the amount of money that people would be on the hook for. Advantages, you get more financial resources. In other words, you have more people participating, so you're going to get more money there. And there are no special taxes that go along with partnerships. Downside, division of the profits sometimes. You don't want any arguments as far as who gets what. And a lot of times there's difficulty in termination. If somebody decides to leave, the other person that was left is still on the hook for everything that was there. Before you even do a partnership, it's almost like a marriage. You, rather, you better be willing to almost live with that person for some reason. Do you share the same goals? Do you have the same vision? Can you trust that other person? 
Can that other person accept constructive criticism? So there's a lot of questions that you probably want to ask. Then you get into what's called C-Corps, okay? Regular corporations. Whenever you think about uh, a big business like a Walmart or a GM or an IBM, you're looking at a C-Corp. It's basically a company that has been chartered in a particular state to operate a particular business for the for the benefit of their stockholders, the owners. Now, when you start thinking about different corporate types, you have alien corporations, okay? They are chartered in another country, and they do business in the United States. So, for example, Sanofi Pharmaceuticals, they're actually a French company. They're doing business here in the United States. Domestic corporations are businesses where they are incorporated in a particular state and they do business in that particular state. Foreign corporations are where they are incorporated in a separate state and doing business in a state. So for example, you go to Walmart. Walmart was incorporated in some other state, even though they operate in Kansas and Missouri and things like that. They are incorporated in a different state. They're considered a foreign corporation. Now private corporations or closely held corporations is a corporation that's been set up and all the stock is owned by a few folks. So for example, Hallmark. All of the stock for Hallmark is owned by the Hall family. It's closely held. It's a private corporation. Public corporations sell stock to the general public. You can go to the New York Stock Exchange and various other things and buy stock and become an owner in a different corporation. Then you have quasi-public corporations. So for example, um, utility companies. They are basically an approved monopoly. They are set up as a corporation. However, they are constrained by the government in various ways. Professional corporations, typically providing professional services, such as accountants, lawyers, things like this. They will set up, sometimes they will set up their firms as professional corporations. You have nonprofit corporations. A lot of the nonprofits that are out there are incorporated. However, they are not incorporated to get to make money or profit for the owners. What they're doing is trying to do social good. Now, there's a lot of advantages to the corporation. First of all, when you buy stock in a corporation, you have limited liability. If the corporation does something bad, or there's some other issues that go along with it where money is going to have to be paid out, you are on the hook for only the amount of money that you paid for that stock. It makes it much easier for the corporation to raise money for investments and growth and things like this. Very easy for ownership change. If you don't want to be a, an owner in that business anymore, you can sell your stock. Disadvantages is the initial cost as far as getting the corporation set up. In other words, the best thing to do is go through a lawyer to make sure that you're getting everything done correctly. Double taxation. What that means is the corporation, the company, is doing business, they're making sales, and then they pay income tax. They then distribute the profits to the owners, to the stockholders. As a stockholder, you're getting this profit, you are then taxed on that profit. So there is that double taxation that goes along with it. So there are some downsides to corporations. The thing is, there are also a lot of upsides. If you decide to buy stock in a company, you are now one of the owners. And you have say in who you elect as the board of directors. The board of directors are responsible to the owners, to the stockholders. So you vote and decide on who the board of directors are. The board of directors then hire the various officers in the organization. So for example, the CEO, the chief executive officer, the COO, the chief operating officer, the CFO, chief financial officer. So they decide the board of directors decides who the officer is going to be. They then decide who the managers are as far as running the business and then the employees. So when you buy stock, you have an impact and you have a say in how the business is being run through the board of directors. Some of the large private companies are I'm sure that you've heard of. In other words, Coke Industries, all of their stock is owned by the Coke family. You have Albertsons, great big food uh, uh, food markets. 
Publix, Ernst & Young for accounting. So there's a lot of large private organizations closely held. Hallmark is another. Now, anybody can incorporate, set up a business and incorporate it. A lot of times people who are running trucks, doctors, all kinds of folks will set up a corporation. The whole idea behind it is to protect their personal assets. They put money into it. If there's something that goes south, then they're on the hook for only that money that they put in that people can't go after their personal assets. Then you have the idea of S-Corps. Right? S-Corps are set up and look like a corporation, however, they're taxed as a sole proprietorship. Now, they're basically small. They have no more than 100 shareholders in order to be an S-Corp. There's only one class of stock. In other words, common stock. There's no preferred stock. And so the whole idea behind this is you have a company that's a relatively small company. You have less than 100 shareholders or, people, or owners in the company, and you're being taxed on the profits based on what is distributed to the various owners. A limited liability company, LLC, many times are, again, smaller businesses, and there's a lot of accountants and lawyers and advertising firms that are set up as LLC. Disadvantages, you don't have stock that can actually be sold. It, the company that's an LLC is not listed on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ or anything like that. And they tend to have a limited life lifespan. Many times, as an LLC grows, they might decide to go public and issue stock in other areas. In other words, they change their corporate form. Mergers are kind of like marriages. In other words, you have two companies that are getting together to form one. Acquisitions are where one company buys another company. When you start talking about mergers, there's three different types. You have vertical, horizontal, and conglomerate. Now, what does that mean? A horizontal merger is where you have two companies in the same industry getting together to form one. A vertical merger is where you have a company that is merging with another company that is supplying the materials for the one company. In other words, they're in kind of the same industry, but they're related. Conglomerate mergers are where you have two very uh, different types of companies getting together and merging into one, different industries. And you might hear about leverage buyouts. Leverage buyouts is where employees of the company decide to typically decide to purchase the company. Now there could be an outside group that decides to purchase all the stock of a company and they do it via leverage. When we do, when we say leverage, what we mean is there's a lot of debt involved. Example, in Springfield, Missouri, there was a company that was owned by international harvesters who, was, who were rebuilding diesel engines. There were about 120 people working there. International Harvester decided that they were going to close that company. And the people who were working there, the management said, you know what, we can't let that happen. We can't let all these folks lose their, uh, lose their jobs and you know, not be able to put food on the table, things like that. So I think it was like 13 people, the senior management and uh, some other folks of that company were able to scrape together half a million, uh, you know, 500000 maybe $800,000, and then take on millions of dollars in debt to buy that company from the International Harvester. They renamed it Springfield Remanufacturing, and it has done very, very well. Franchising is a great way to get into businesses. In other words, what you're doing is you're basically buying an ongoing business or business model. And what happens is you're going to pay a portion of your sales and profits to the franchise to to the franchising company in order to run your business. Now, went too far. There's the advantages to franchises, okay? You have a lot of existence that goes along with the company. 
In other words, they have a particular business model and they will help you get it set up. They'll help you figure out where to put it, how are you going to get your financing, things like that. You have that nationally recognized name. That's huge. In other words, think about it. Everybody knows what McDonald's is. And if you decide to open a McDonald's franchise, you get a lot of uh, help there. Disadvantages, large startup costs. It costs a bunch to set up a McDonald's and some of the others too. There's a lot of management regulation. In other words, here are the things that you have to do in order to run that business. And you can't sell just anything that you want. You will have a particular thing that you can do as far as your business is concerned. When it comes to diversity, there's not as many women in franchising as there are in regular business. And one of the things that's happening is there are various franchises that are trying to appeal more towards women to get more women into franchising. In Dunkin' Brands, Dunkin' Donuts, there's doing quite a bit as far as getting other minorities into franchising and franchise-owned businesses. Now there's a lot of also home franchise home-based franchises. In other words, you have a particular business, you franchise that business, and you just run it from home. You can see there's some advantages. Uh, relief from commuting, uh, low overhead. Companies such as Snap-on Tools are basically home-based franchises. Uh, Macco Tools, uh, Chem Dry Carpet and, and Upholstery Clean. These are all home-based franchises that you can buy into. And a lot of the franchises are moving into e more e-commerce. In other words, they're doing more and more online as far as selling the products and things like this. There's also much more in the way of social media. In other words, the marketing that they're doing, uh, the sales of the products and things like this. So they're getting more into technology. There is also a move into franchising globally. So for example, there are uh, McDonald's franchises that will go into, say, Japan. However, there's going to be some differences as far as the menus that they offer because the tastes in Japan are very different than they are in the United States. Some of the bigger franchises, things like 7-Eleven, Dairy Queen, Dunkin' Donuts, UPS Store, uh, are pretty big as far as franchises. You want to get into a good franchise, one that costs less than a lot of the others? Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A makes it much easier to open a store and run that as far as the cost is concerned. There are a lot of restrictions as far as where it's going to go and what it is that you actually offer and the amount of service that you offer too. Then you have the idea of co-ops. Co-ops are where typically neighbors get together and put together a business and they hire somebody to run that business uh, professionally. For example, in a lot of farming areas, there are a lot of co-ops. So for example, the folks who are managing the, the, the grain silos and things like that, many times is a co-op. So those are some of the key points from Chapter 5. If you have questions, please give me a call.